This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my colleague, Perry Merling, who has been at the vanguard of the formation of the Young Scholars Initiative, made an enormously successful course on money and banking that's been on a number of platforms, and uh, has really been at the core of the evolution of INET since it was formed at the time of the great financial crisis. We're here today to discuss his newest book, which is called Money and Empire, Charles P. Kindleberger and the Dollar System. And as he mentions in the preface, I am a uh, person who is very, very grateful to Charles Kindleberger. I had joined as an undergraduate at MIT with the intention of being a naval architect. And Charles Kindleberger inspired me to move in the direction of curiosity, economics, economic history, and financial economics, and had a very, very big impact on my thinking and my career. But Perry, uh, thank you for joining me today. And uh, I, I'm looking forward very much to what your insights are about this man who, who helped shape my life. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. How did you come to the place where you wanted to write about Charles Kindleberger and about his relationship to the world, to academia? What, what triggered your enthusiasm? Well, I suppose it sort of parallels the creation of INET in a way. I uh, was um, the initial uh, proposal that I made in the first grant round, if you remember, um, was for a book that was tracing the rise of the global dollar system, period. Kindleberger was not so much a part of that. That was meant to be a follow-up to my 1911 book, The New Lombard Street, um, which was about the financial crisis. Um, and uh, when I got started with that, I found uh, Kindleberger, uh, the Kindleberger archives, uh, I found some things also in in the Modigliani archives, some conversation between them about the future of the international monetary system. And I realized that I could tell the story in a different way, not as the story of of the rise of the dollar uh, only, but but really through through using his life as the arc of the of the story. And so that's how it kind of got started. Um, and, uh, and the reason for doing the original project was that I felt that new Lombard street, when I finished it, when I looked at it, I realized that the global financial crisis, I had told that story as a story of the biography of the fed, that it was created in 1913. And it was a sort of, a, a, a story of its adolescence and it's growing through crises and up to the global financial crisis. So it was a story of that institution. And I realized that what was missing really in that book was the was the global story because I focused so much on the Fed, the the what and so I that's why I was trying to write the international money story. Um, and I also realized that my MOOC also the the which also um, INET INET published um, was originally about the U.S. Mon monetary uh, uh, money markets um, using Stigum, and it wasn't adequately international. So one of the goals that I had in the last 10 years was to extend the money view to international and using this book as part of the vehicle for doing that and, and, and therefore entering Charlie's mind. Charlie seemed to me when I found him uh, you know, here's a guy who actually knows something, you know, how does he know what he knows? How can I enter that mind? How can I build on what seemed to me a very wise person? Um, and, uh, and so, so it was, I had selfish reasons for it. I had, uh, there are a number of reasons converging for why, for why to write this book. Now you start the first segments of the book are about the formation of Charles Kindleberger's career, life, understanding, and so forth. And I guess as the Institute for New Economic Thinking, we're always interested in how unusual or creative people came to life and how they interacted with the profession and what difference they made. So over the course of this conversation, I, I guess we'll understand more if you can share with us what what took place in the formative experience of Charlie Kinderberger that you think was important in who he became. Well, the um, the first four 
chapters are about that formation. Um, I should um, also just alert your your listeners that although this looks like intellectual biography, and it is an intellectual biography, and that's one of the reasons that people are interested in it, particularly people like you who who knew and admired him, um, it's also meant to be a history of the global dollar itself, okay, all the events growing, and it's also meant to be a history of the evolution of economic thought. Um, so in every chapter, there's these three stories are kind of intertwined. Sometimes one is more prominent. I, I think that at the, so I'm trying to set the stage in the first four chapters, particularly for people who don't necessarily have an economics background. So I have to teach them a little economics. And, the, and so my strategy there was to basically follow Charlie's own education, okay? And to say, how did he learn what he, what he knew so that the reader can be educated in the same way. Um, so it's important to realize, so he was born in 1910. And so he sort of came to maturity in the roaring 20s um, and uh, in, uh, in, in New York City, he was born in New York City. And, the, uh, and then the depression hit. And uh, that was a big, a big uh, uh, effect on his family finances. Um, and he was more or less alone in the world um, after that. Um, his father was a was a very well-to-do lawyer who basically then clients don't pay lawyers in the Depression. So the family finances fell apart and he went to graduate school at Columbia. And so I, I think that the those years in the wilderness, I guess, you know, in from 1933 to 1937, when he's doing his PhD, um, are the formation and the key people for in in influencing him are are here H. Parker Willis, who had been played a very important role in creating the Fed in the first place, um, and I suggest I came to believe that that in a way this was a role model for Charlie that he thought he would use that he would spend his life trying to create an international monetary system that was integrated in the same way that Willis had done for the United States, knitting together the different parts of the U.S. There had not been a central bank, of course, in the U.S. until 1913. And so that sort of, I guess, young adulthood ambition, which is pretty large, <laughs> um, I think helps to explain a lot, of, a lot of what he continued on doing. So Willis was important. Um, Angel was important, James Angel, um, as an internationalist, American, but an internationalist, um, student of Alan Young from Harvard, um, and uh, I, I think he learned almost like a negative example from Angel, that Angel was a big supporter of the League of Nations, multilateralism, and that basically didn't work. And not only because the Congress refused to, to join up, um, but Charlie, remember, you, you know this, that in, in Charlie's mature life, he emphasized the importance of leadership of the United States as a leader, um, not multilateralism, but 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 more but more leadership. I think that was because of the disappointing example of Angel in a way. Um, but then most important, I think, was, um, was, was John H. Williams, who was then a professor at Harvard, but he was vice president at the New York Fed. So when Charlie got his PhD, um, he got a job at at the New York Fed, there were no academic jobs. And so he was a central banker for quite a while. And John H. Williams was his sort of not immediate boss, but but was his his thinking sort of infused the New York Fed um, at that time. And uh and and in fact his key currency um uh he was pushing this key currency idea as early as 1933 at the World Economic Conference in London which didn't go anywhere. He thought we needed to stabilize pound against the sterling, not multilateral. Okay, so this multi, this idea of key currencies, it comes from J John H. Williams. And, uh, and and it was really all the New York Fed was, was on board with that, but it didn't happen until 1936, the tripartite agreement, which was to stabilize sterling and, and the dollar and the French franc. And that was really why Charlie was hired, to be sort of a staff support for the data behind that. And so that's how he started his career, was working toward international monetary stabilization inside the Fed in, you know, as, a, as a staffer, um, which he did for a couple of years. And then he moved to the BIS in Basel, uh, which, was, uh, which he had hoped to be for a long time, but war interrupted that. And he came back to the New York Fed, uh, sorry, to the to this time to, to DC, to the Board of Governors, and worked with Alvin Hansen for a while. Um, and then had a good war. He was in the OSS, 
um, in London. Um, and I tell this, that story in chapter three. I think that's a lot of where his sort of his empirical approach to the world um, got started and his willingness to um, to, to form uh, a narrative, a view on the basis of disparate kinds of pieces of data that you don't need a complete time series or, or you know, you, you, to give advice to the generals about where to bomb in order to, to hurt the German war effort. You can't wait for all the data. You, you, you have to take piece together this and that. And, uh, and I think his intellectual formation, that was very key uh, for the, the style when he became an economic historian later on, you know, that that was the style that he was. Uh, and uh, not, not, I mean, he was not really one ever for digging in the archives. He was reading all the stuff that other people dug up. They were like the field reports coming in from, from uh, that he was an intelligence analyst sort of putting together, well, well, what do we, what does this all add up to? Um, and so I think that was an important formative too. And of course, that's not really, he, it's, he's not an economics job. It's a, it's a, it's an intelligence analyst job. And he, he was cleared for ultra. So he was a very high ranking intelligence officer and traveled with General Bradley after D-Day on, on the, on the continent. Uh, and then came back in the state department and was the head of the of sort of reconstruction of German Germany and Austria, the division inside uh, in, inside the State Department, um, and and ultimately worked under General Marshall in getting together the legislation for the Marshall Plan, um, which almost killed him. It was so much work, but the uh, and then he started his academic career in 1948. So all of that stuff you're asking about formation. Okay, this is this is a guy who has so many influences right before he's before he's 38 that he's in the war and he's in the state department and he's in the fed and he's in the bis and he and 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 the world is a chaotic time okay so all all, all none of these these influences are not integrated yet they become integrated i think throughout his academic career that he'd had enough excitement so sitting sitting in his chair in his office at mit writing books was perfectly fine with him because he'd had enough excitement, I think, for the first 38 years. And by then he had four children, too. So he just settled down and uh, and 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 stayed and stayed there. Um, and uh, you you met him many years after that. But but you asked about the formation. And so I spend, you know, I, I think there is a sort of inspirational. I, I'm inspired by that, by somebody who couldn't. He had to adapt. You know, this world is not it's not easy. To, to have a life of a scholar. And so you try to do it where you can, you know, at the Fed or in the State Department or, or, uh, or, or even, or even in the army. So the, uh, it's, uh, you're, you're adapting. He became a, he's a very, was a very resilient and I think sort of emotionally stable person, um, not, not, not given to defeatism. Um, and this is where it was all formed, um, in that, in those, in those early years. Um, so I, my strategy in writing these books, this isn't the first time I've tried to do this sort of thing, is I think the juvenilia is extremely important, right? Instead of saying, well, what are the most famous books? Let's, let's focus on them. I say, let, what are the least famous books? You know, what are the stuff he was writing when he never thought anyone was going to read it? You know, then you can find out, you know, where he came from. And so I spend a lot of time on that digging digging up you know details from his childhood and who his friends were and things like that what life was like at columbia in that period um and that's not that's not just you know idle curiosity or or adding color i think it helps to understand the mature man where sure. where he mm -hmm. where he came from yeah well you know as you have been a which michael shepherd and a, a, a key shepherd in the development of the Young Scholars Initiative, I think young scholars who are contemplating what direction to take in their career will benefit greatly from the journey you take them on in this book to understand, first of all, what, what you might call formative experiences inspired him to go in these directions. Like you said, his family losing money, et cetera, and the disorientation. The second, being uh, which, which you might call the, the inferences or the patterns he recognized from his experience in the field. And then the question of becoming an academic, 
I guess I would say he's on a different trajectory than many people in the post John Hicks and Samuelson era, where quantitative, particularly conceptual modeling is really at the vanguard. And when he comes to a place like MIT, he's really interfacing with people whose quantitative skills are their gift and their focus. What was it like for him to be almost speaking a different language of economics than most of the faculty who were his colleagues? Well, um, he joined MIT in 1948. And um, the what we think of as MIT today as this high-powered statistical modeling, mathematical modeling, that was really not the case in 48 um, yet at all. Um, and in fact, I should maybe back up and say he, his idea of joining academia was to keep a foot in both in the public policy world that he had been in for 12 years. He had been a civil servant, really. And he was he wanted to basically do the same kind of work he had done in government, except in the university now. And so he wanted to have a foot in both worlds. And then because he lost his security clearance, um, he was unable to get him to do any government work anymore. So he had to really commit to academia now. He had tried to get other academic jobs. He had, he had interviewed at Yale and also at Princeton. And the faculty there, there were all, there were always, uh, they, they, they responded negatively to him because he was supporting the Marshall Plan. And they were saying, all we really need to do, we don't need the state involvement here. You know, we should just let the market work. And so they wouldn't hire him. Okay. MIT was willing to take a, to take a flyer on this guy, basically. Um, and they, he didn't have a job interview, really. You know, they just took a flyer on him. And I tell the story about how that happened. I mean, Sam, Samuelson knew who he was. Um, everyone knew there were so few people in graduate school at that time, right? They all they all knew each other. Um, and uh, and so and his first book, The Dollar Shortage, was really the economics of the Marshall Plan. So he he got tenured at MIT for exactly this argument about why we need why we need the Marshall Plan, um, whereas other places weren't willing to even hire him for it. So so they they took a flyer on him and he always was uh, appreciative of that. Um, I, I think that, so some of the story I tell in chapter five about, I call it tech, to, to, to remind people that it, MIT was, was tech, it was what they called it um, back at the, at the, at the at the, at the beginning. Um, and the department was an interdisciplinary department with, with political scientists um, originally. It separated later and, be, and got professionalized, but and it was a service department to the engineers, which was most of the, most of the students at MIT. Um, and uh, Samuelson's famous textbook, which he wrote in 1948, um, was intended to, to be like, well, how can we teach economics to engineers? Okay, well, engineers are used to this sort of training, so let's create a textbook that's appropriate for them. That textbook then became the best-selling textbook and took over all the departments. I don't think that was Samuelson's intention at the beginning. It was really to teach economics to the engineers. Um, and the and 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 there was other things about the early days in MIT that that I uncovered. Um, the importance of the inter, of interactions with the IMF, for example, um, that went both ways. Um, and the so the international. Uh, his international economics experience. He, he was there. There were that was a way to get involved with with uh, with policy work. When you can't get hired by by the U.S. government, um, you could engage with the IMF and 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 also and also the World Bank and and the BIS. He had been employed at the BIS, and he never lost those those connections. Um, but so when you say that it was a difficult time for him, I think that difficulty didn't become, because of the changing mores of how to be an academic, that didn't really, I think, become a difficulty until, you know, maybe the early 60s or something like that, you know, so what, because it was actually 1966 when MIT made a very specific decision, the department, like we are going to, to really grab the brass ring and try to upgrade and be the place that ambitious young young graduate students are going to want to come and we're going to provide this kind of training that will will separate us from the pack. So it wasn't it wasn't really until 66 and, and at that time Charlie is is 56. 
Okay. And he is, uh, and, and he is willing to, he goes along with this, but he realizes there's not, there's not that much place for him in a department like that. So he tries to go into administration for a while, um, at MIT and he sees the writing on the wall with the student uprising and says, I don't think it's a good time to be an administrator. So he, 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 he goes, he, he takes a year's leave and goes to Atlanta, uh, to teach in the historically black colleges. That's when Martin Luther King is, is assassinated. Um, and I think that was a big turning point in his life too, where he recommitted to the scholarly life. Okay. Instead of saying, okay, I guess I'm a washed up dinosaur. You know, um, he said, you know, there's important stuff that's happening. And particularly also the dollar system was coming under attack at that time. And so I think he recommitted that year away was a period when he recommitted. And when he came back, that's when he wrote The World in Depression. That's when he started that line of thinking, which is what we remember him for, The World in Depression. And then after he retired, 78 was, he, he was forced to retire in 1976 because of the mandatory retirement. Um, and uh, the, uh, and so, so many is panics and crashes, which is probably his most famous book to the general public, was a was a work of retirement in order to make a little money because um, he didn't have a, had a rather meager pension. Um, but also, he's on his own now. He's no longer he's no longer sort of has to be a team player at MIT. He's retired, so he can do whatever he wants. So he and then and then the wor work that he calls his his chedevra, the the financial history of Western Europe. Um, is is uh, it comes after that, and then he's elected to be the president of the American Economic Association. So he had he had a good. Th th there's a third career here, you know, that comes really after his official retirement, and after he becomes sort of persona, uh, you know, n not non grata, but but not necessary. He was not. There was nothing he was adding to this MIT strategy, um, and uh, the uh, that must have felt pretty bad for him. <laughs> you know, he had been he had been a builder of this, right? He was in he was like, you know, employee number three or something. He was he was hired before Solo, right? And so he had really, really helped build this department that then kind of had no use for him. And uh, but he just took that and said, OK, I'll do something else. And that's what he uh, that's what he did. So it's it, you're right to say that that it is surprising to find somebody with this pre-World War II sort of sensibility at MIT. That is a little fish out of water. It was not so much fish out of water in 48. Okay. It became, in fact, because he came from the OSS, you remember there were some scandals about CIA money being going going into MIT. But but um, the CIA was the the follow up to the OSS, and so he I think that's actually one of the reasons he was attractive to them when they hired him, <laughs> that he had this he had this sort of clearance and this government experience. But then when he lost his clearance, he wasn't useful for that anymore. So uh, so he had to find another way. And it, it this is a story of of, of resilience of following an intellectual course um, and just doggedly, you know, getting up every day and going into the office um, mm -hmm. and taking advantage of what opportunities arise and, and not getting discouraged by, get, uh, by rejection, just find another way. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty inspiring, um, I, I, I found. Um, but, but so young scholars, you're speaking about young scholars, the, Yes. Yeah, so th so this mathematical and statistical um, modeling kind of hegemony that's taken over education um, is is uh, everyone, every department, you have to, you know, get trained to a certain level. The question, though, is sort of where do the ideas come from? OK, and they I mean, these are these are techniques. Right. So they're techniques uh, for. But but where do, where do your ideas come from? And I think that Charlie, there were people at MIT, graduate students at MIT, who really did appreciate him as a man of ideas. Right. That you could talk to him about your research. You then had to go to someone else to help you with the econometrics and, and the mathematical modeling. But he could think without writing down equations. He could think without running regressions. And that was a pretty unusual skill. Um, and so that's partly what the book is about, is, you know, understanding. Here's a guy who, who was right about a lot of things, e even when his more technically trained colleagues were not. You know, why was he right? 
what what how did he think about the world what was what was it that he knew that i need to know and i need to enter that mind and so that that's the payoff for me is feeling like i i can i know how he thought now and so i can do it myself um and uh that's uh that's that's what's made it worth it for for me it's not it's not just um because i like writing intellectual biographies no i'm trying to learn monetary economics and and he taught me in international economics really most of what i know now mm. through this project you know not that i was yeah. ever his his student um yeah i had the uh, good fortune of coming on scene in the fall of 1976 at mit and about a year later Looking so for he had just lectures. retired. He had just retired. Yes. Okay. Yes, but he was yeah, still yeah. teaching international yeah, trade. He, he was teaching and, halftime then. Yeah, and he was teaching a course related to the financial history of Western Europe, with the manias, panics, and crashes infused in it. So, uh, um, I came from a family where my mother uh, had a f Scottish father and a German mother. And their professional lives were very disrupted by the Great Depression. So in the, what you might call folklore of my formative years, that anxiety about finance uh, was ever present. And here I am trying to be a naval architect. And then I come across this guy who seems to illuminate with the world in depression and some of these other works that were in progress, the kind of concerns that had unsettled my mother's life. And uh, I, I think from which I call the echoes of her distress, it ignited my curiosity in a way that he, I would say nourished me tremendously. He was also extremely pleasant. He had groups of students of which he included me that he would take to the Boston Symphony Orchestra's rehearsals. He got somehow C. Giozawa's team uh, allowed him to bring in six or eight people to watch the rehearsals before they would start a new concert agenda. And then we'd all have coffee afterwards. He, he was just, he was a, a very warm and magnetic individual. And then, as I said, dealing with these things that echoed to the concerns of my family. Uh, you had mentioned in a couple of uh, times in this conversation that Charlie lost his security clearance. And I know that you've also been uh, had access to documentation and so forth in the archives that uh, there was some anxiety that related to um, what you might call his international connectedness or whatever. And in that kind of hard Cold War period in the McCarthy age and so forth, what was going on there? What was going on that led someone with that much experience and successful experience losing a security clearance? Um, well, it was, uh, I. so I. you're right that I, he, he got his FBI file through the Freedom of Information Act, um, right. which I believe was passed in 66 or something. So he wrote off for this. And initially they sent him garbage and he wrote off again. And so he finally got this file. And so um, he knew why he, he eventually knew why he lost his security clearance. Um, and he put those documents in the archives at the, at the Truman Library. Um, which a uh, serious archive. And so we, uh, so I was able to see it and, 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 and read it. Um, and the, he wondered for a long time why he did, why he lost that. Cause it, he lost it in 19, uh, I think it was 19, 1951. Um, uh, and the, uh, and he, and of course they don't tell you, you know, they just say denied. Okay. And yeah. that's it. So he had, of course, he had lots of of interactions with people who were on the left um and uh in the 20s in the 30s you know um, certainly new york was a very a, a very political place in the 30s um and the and he had he had lots of uh, acquaintances who were in various political groups um the and so he was wondering if that was the problem the actual what what got him was it seemed that Hoover 
um, actually kind of went after him. Um, uh, he had been the... Uh, so Hoover, had, you're not talking about... You're talking about J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover, yes, not Thank president. You. Yeah, yeah, right. yes. The um, he had uh, uh, as a graduate student. I mean, he, talk about you know, sort of bad coincidence. Um, while he was while while Charlie was waiting to get this offer from the New York Fed, which he thought he would get because he had some inside connections, um, he was at loose ends, and so he took a summer job at the Treasury. Okay. Um, and under Harry Dexter White. Um, and so uh, he was, when, when Harry Dexter White came under suspicion, um, anyone who was connected with Harry Dexter White came under suspicion. And he had put Harry Dexter White as, uh, when he was applying for security clearance, he had put Harry Dexter White on an earlier, earlier application as a reference, you know, so this is somebody. And so this brought him to the attention of the of the authorities, so that was strike one. Um, and uh, but then they investigated, and, and another strike was was Robert T. Miller, um, and who was a year ahead of him at the Kent School, and who was a friend of of his wife's brother, and so they kept in contact with him. And both Harry Dexter White and and Robert Miller were brought before the House on Un American Activities Committee. Um, you know, really pretty shortly before Charlie was denied security clearance. So this was the, these were the two major things. There was another, there was a third strike, um, which was that somebody who was a member of the Communist Party, I think his name was David Wall or something, had included his name as people in the State Department who are friendly. Sir. Um, so meaning probably that he wouldn't hang up the phone on you or that he might, he might, talk to you or something, which of course he would, that's who he was. Um, but he was, but it, that's not to say that he was, a he was working for the, for the, the U S communist party, much less a spy for Russia or anything like that. Um, but those were the three strikes that then, that then, uh, ruled against him. Now it turned out all though, all that information was available to, uh, uh, already when he got the security clearance, for, to, to work with the Marshall Plan, okay? But the people who ran the Marshall Plan overruled it. And they said, you you know, look, this guy, we need this guy. None of this amounts to anything. So we're going to approve it, okay? And so he thought that would happen again when, when he applied three years later, and it did not because there were different people who were reading the file. And so he was denied. So he, and, and this is, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this is a devastating kind of blow for him, not only because it's he 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 had been cleared for ultra. You know, he was a very high ranking intelligence officer and and all of that was very top secret and nobody even knew about ultra until many, many years later. And he certainly didn't tell anybody about it. Um, and uh, so but none of that mattered. And he had a he had a bronze star. You know, he was a, he was kind of a war hero. OK, so to be this. So this was personally, I think, painful, but it was more painful because it meant that he couldn't have the life he was planning to have with a foot in both worlds. Um, and so he had to find another, another way. And the, um, and I think, you know, many of his friends, you know, people were also brought in under this and their lives were also very disrupted by this witch hunt. Um, and some of them lost their jobs permanently, you know, I, I, there, so he was relatively lucky that he, you know, MIT was not only willing to take a risk on him, but they were willing to give him tenure, you know, at a time when when the witch hunt was getting people thrown out of their of their. So that's another reason to be kind of loyal to MIT. And uh, and he was a loyal, loyal sort of guy, you know, in, in, in his character. Um, so but that was, uh, you know, that's also useful to remember that that those times um, that it's it it swept in a lot of people um, who were who had who had you know really tremendous contributions to the United States government service you know and to be uh, to be re not having their service you know <laughs> I think is is a was was a loss to the United States um, and uh, it's. Uh, you see that as part of the of, of another obstacle he had to overcome. Hmm. In uh, 
his interactions at MIT after losing the security clearance? Did that create barriers to his collaboration with colleagues? Were, were they, if you might say, uh, embodying a caution light about you know, Charlie's not, uh, there must be something unsavory, did it? Um, I don't think in terms of the economics department, you know, when I, when I, uh, I don't think that none of them thought that he was unsavory. Okay. Um, Samuelson, Solo, none of them, but there wasn't a, a very important impact, which is that center for international studies. Okay. Which became, which was sort of like the, the center of social science research at MIT took CIA money. Okay. And you had to have a security clearance. Okay. In order to be a part of that operation. And so, for example, Walt Rostow, who he hired, he had been a wartime buddy of his, um, in, Lo in London. And so, um, uh, Walt Rostow was part of that and he couldn't be a part of that. So he had to find his intellectual community basically down the river at, at Harvard or rather up the river, I suppose, at, at Harvard, at the, at the center for national affairs and, um, where he, and so he did, and he also taught at Tufts, you know, so he had to, l luckily Boston is a pretty, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of intellectual community that you can find if you look around for it. And so he did. And his, uh, uh, th but these were, I would say these are more institutional barriers than, than a notion that he was an unsavory character. Um, I remember Charlie inspiring me to cross register and take a number of courses at Harvard that were related to international affairs or the development of multinational enterprise in particular, uh, Richard Caves taught a course that uh, was quite uh, uh, interesting and deep dive. And I remember he had a student, was it Stephen Heimer, uh, who had written about multinational enterprise. And uh, I, I read in your book that his work was not allowed to be published in the MIT series. But Kindleberger started us with reading that thesis and then encouraged us all to go to, over to Harvard to learn more in what he thought was a, a, an enormously important development for the future, which proved to be quite true. Yes. Yeah, so this, this role of the multinational corporation, um, I think it's right what you say. So Stephen Heimer was, was Charlie's student, not Richard Cave's student. Um, and he wrote his PhD and he wrote, just to be clear, he, 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 he wrote his, um, dissertation at MIT. Um, and, um, and Charlie was his was his supervisor, and he tried to help him get jobs in various places too. And he died tragically early, and so Charlie tried to continue some of that research agenda to keep it a lot, make sure that people notice this. Um, I think Charlie's own interest in this, um, well, and he wrote even a little book uh, on business abroad or something, a series of lectures. So, and he included this in his international economics textbook. So he here's the point. That remember, he's he's thinking that the that there are forces leading to integration, global integration, um, and uh, universal money, and so forth. And he's thinking that the multinational corporation is one of them. You know that the nation state is is opposing this, right? The nation state is trying to have its own polity, um, but the, the the multinational corporation is a global is a global thing. And so he's quite interested in that. He thought, I think, initially. He he thought that the he took from Hansen this idea of secular stagnation that that the way to get global growth was to channel capital from the global north to the global south. Okay, so you needed to have capital markets. Um, so that's why the World Bank was always much more important than the IMF uh, for project finance uh, in in his mind. Um, this was. This was true of John H. Williams too, and the uh, so, but that wasn't really happening very much. So what he saw the multinational corporation initially as well, maybe this is a way through the internal accounting of an of a multinational corporation to channel capital to the global south. When he looked at it with Steve Heimer, he realized not a lot. That's not a lot of what's happening. What's what what Heimer found is that these multinational corporations are sort of. Uh, creating um, branches, okay, in these countries, but then they kind of are locally financed inside those countries. So there's not a lot of capital flow, but there is they're they're integrated 
in in this goal. So they are an integrating factor, but it's not the capital flow thing that Charlie was initially initially got interested in. Um, but so there you go, nonetheless. So that's why he stopped sort of working on that. And it was really so it's that's something I don't make very much of in the book because I'm trying to follow the money arc, you know, but it is definitely a, a story that is worth its own. That's a spin-off that could be its own paper. Um, I think to, to track that because there was a lot of work there, a lot of books and conferences and things like that. Um, and he collected it all in a book called Multinational Corporation. So, so there he there was that was a lot of work that he did on that. Ultimately, it wasn't it wasn't part of. Uh, I wouldn't say it was central. It wound up not being central once he learned how these corporations work. Um, but so he this is important to appreciate because you know so he has these friends on the left. It's very common on the left, of course, to be anti-globalization, anti-multinational corporation. So he got into trouble with some of his friends about this attitude that maybe, maybe in fact, the multinational corporation is a is a progressive influence in terms of of economic development, in terms of 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 globalization, in terms of integration. Um, and that was not a popular uh, opinion, um, but uh, he, he wasn't shy about about saying it because I think he 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 believed it. He believed it. Yeah, he he brought a lot of things, I say, to the table. Um, when I first met him, I was, as I had mentioned, wanting to be a naval architect. And uh, he said to me, why don't you add economics as a second major? And I said, well, OK, but that's a lot of it, of course. And he said, no, if you take you're good at math, you take the advanced micro macro econometrics, you get nine courses for taking three because you get you, you take the advanced, which qualifies you for the intermediate and the intro. So you're down the path. And then he said, then what you just got to do is a couple of interesting projects. And he, he had suggested I go over and meet Raymond Vernon about multinational stuff. And then he said, he kind of stopped me. And he said, I know, that, you know, with the OPEC crisis, you're working with Morris Edelman. I was a re what's called undergraduate research opportunities, Europe at MIT. He said, I'm interested in petrodollar recycling to the global south. How, do, how does the Middle East money get back to nourishing the LDCs, the low, low developed countries, as he called them? And how does that work? And then he said, but, you know, the sailing thing, you should bring that to economics. And he told me he was interested in writing a book about how the pattern of trade in the competition between the Dutch and the British Empire was affected by the strategies of nautical technology in each country, particularly how, uh, how did he put it, uh, how a ship which is going to have precious cargo can protect itself. And he talked about how the British had put the guns on the boat so they could go to Asia, come back and protect themselves. Whereas the Dutch had essentially the equivalent of PT boats surrounding the boat that carried the truth. And so if they went on a long voyage, each PT boat would get picked off in different conflicts and then essentially the, the treasure could be taken. And, he ended up asking me to write my junior paper on these differences in technology and so forth. And, and he wrote a book, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's like Maritime and Markets or something like Ma that. Mariners and Markets. That was, that was, markets. That was yeah. long after he retired. In fact, when he, when he moved to the assisted living uh, community yes. at yes. Brookhaven. And I, I think it was a work of uh, – of therapy <laughs> for him to um, his wife had had a stroke and he had and he had to leave his beloved house in Lincoln and so it was returning to a childhood interest. He was he was a he was an amateur sailor um, and he he loved that. He he often said that his only regret in life was that he never had enough money to buy a sailboat. You know, but he but he rented he rented sailboats sometimes and went on and and did these cruises with 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 family and friends. Um, and, uh, and when he was, a, and he, when, when he was in college, he, he, in fact, was on a merchant steamer, um, uh, uh, two summers, you know, so this was a summer job, you know, traveling the world as a, as a deckhand. Um, and, uh, that was, um, he, 
In fact, he says a funny thing in his autobiography. He says, for me, international economics began in 1929. Okay. And of course, you might think, well, so it's the Great Depression that made him aware of the internet. But that's not right. It, that's when he was on the first trip, you know, that he got interested in the global world um, on these boats. And he traveled to Leningrad, you know, and, and, and met, you know, the, the Soviet sailors. Um, and, the, and of course, the, the, the crew in these boats is very international. Um, and and pretty rough people too. So he he he, but he loved it. You know that was an incredible adventure as a college boy, as a college boy. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so so sailing to him always had these other resonances. You know of uh, and and I think it's even it's even you know there's there's certain psychological um, uh, resonances, right? When you're you're a sailor, so you know that. You know, you're controlling these forces that could kill you, you know, if you don't control them correctly um, and you could capsize, you know, or uh, and, and, and you're sailing into the wind, too. So the wind is trying to push you this way and you can actually go into the wind if you are 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 appropriate, have the appropriate sails and so forth. And so I think there's a psychological satisfaction and and maybe maybe we could think that he. He, I told you about his resilience, maybe in, in his life obstacles. Maybe another way to say it is that he he was prepared to sail into the wind, okay, and to find, you know, the setting of the sail that would allow him to make forward progress, even when the wind is blowing straight in your face, you know. And so that image, you know, which is from childhood, sailing around Buzzards Bay, actually, um, in with with friends, you know, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, is he was he was he was a lifelong sailor so it gave him something there was something nourishing about that particular uh kind of sport well that's how he actually i was a student in his class but not outspoken in anything about sailing but he had seen a picture of me on deck in annapolis as part of an mit crew at a regatta where mit had had, I believe we were either first or second we had placed, and it was covered in the school newspaper. And when he asked me about this maritime technology becoming my junior paper, becoming a major, he also told me that the person who should be my advisor for as an economics major was Bob Solo, who, along with his wife, was basically spending summers in Martha's Vineyard learning how to sail and was enthusiastic. He said, he'll be enthusiastic about what you know while you're enthusiastic about what he knows. And the first course I took was advanced macro with Bob Solo. And then I agreed to become a major. So Charlie's uh, sailing. And, and the other thing that I always, I, I actually talked to him about this in the spirit of manias, panics, and crashes. I become familiar with Frank Knight and the notion of radical uncertainty, Keynes' treatise on probability. And we had a discussion one day about when you're sailing, whatever the meteorologist says, you can go, then you go out and you basically have to keep an eye on things and improvise. You're not in a structure that where meteorology or whatever was strong enough that you know what's going to happen. But he also, he said to me, the interesting thing about sailing, how did he put it? You can't get scared and go down below because things will get worse. You have to stay on deck in that uncertainty. And I said to him, yeah, that's like people in a financial crisis, isn't it? They can't go run and hide. And he laughed. But I, I remember the sailing analogies being ever present in his teaching and in our conversations. And uh, it's interesting that you bring that formative experience. Uh, so that, I, he never really talked to me about his formative experience. He, he talked about his passion for sailing and for nautical issues, but not the, the things that you've shared with us here today. Moving he didn't talk radical. about himself very much. I mean, that yeah. was, uh, yeah. he, he, th I think that was part of his character that, that he was raised. You're, you're not meant to be, be boasty or, or, uh, you know, yeah. uh, don't assume that people are interested in your life. <laughs> um, yeah. that's sort of narcissistic. And so the, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Interesting. he, he restrained, he restrained that. Um, I think that's actually one of the reasons his autobiography 
is is not very revealing. Okay, because I think he after after a lifetime of not revealing stuff, you know, he's not going to change when he's you know eighty years old and writing his autobiography. So there's facts and figures there, but not not much of a psychological portrait. Um, yeah. And uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about this notion of what does finance look like? You know, I, as an engineer, I could see these models about a terminal condition, optimization, backward induction from the terminal condition, creating the prices and all these things that were uh, even before stochastic, the kind of notion of how dynamic optimization happens. Charlie didn't seem to embrace the capacity of finance to see into the future, that nighty and uncertainty kind of mindset was there. Many people often compare him with Hyman Minsky, who was another person more in the realm of radical uncertainty. Were they colleagues? Did they work together? Uh, were they kindred spirits in, in the unfolding of each of their careers? Well, I think they were kindred spirits. I mean, I, I actually have just written a spinoff uh, on exactly this point um, that will be a paper soon. Um, the uh, they were both sort of formed in pre-war, so they had they share that sort of American institutionalist sort of upbringing. Um, uh, Hyman was uh, nine years younger than than Kinderberger, and so the war disrupted his PhD. Whereas Charlie finished his PhD before the war, uh, uh, Minsky didn't until after the war. And his supervisor was at Harvard, was was Schumpeter, who then died on him. And so the it was Hansen and 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 others who he ultimately came under the wing. So the um, uh, I don't think that Charlie um, knew anything about Minsky um, until he started writing Mania's Panics and Crashes. Um, and um, and he says himself that he learned about him from um, um, uh, the name is escaping me. The, the fellow who wrote the bankers, Martin Mayer, Martin Mayer, um, that, that he mentioned to Martin Mayer that he was writing this thing about about he wanted to write this book about Mania's Panics and Crashes. And, and Martin Mayer said, oh, well, you should have a look at this paper that that Minsky wrote. OK. And so he I think that Charlie had sort of learned in the reception for his uh, first big book, The World in Depression, that people seemed not to get what his argument was there. OK. And I think one reason is that there wasn't uh, there wasn't a model. <laughs> there wasn't. So he could argue this whole thing till he's blue in the face. But what economists are looking for is a model. And so he thought, why don't I use Minsky um, as a sort of vehicle in in writing Maney's Panics and Crashes. And so he did. And he quotes that one article that Martin Mayer told him about. It's funny, though, and, and that then led to further interaction after that, which I'll, which I'll tell you about. The um, And I it's sort of in the footnotes in the book, but it's not pulled together in a whole narrative like I'm doing now. The... Um, he the, the article that he hangs everything on, however, is 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 an article that Char that 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 Minsky wrote in 1966 um, when he was really hadn't yet fully formed his own ideas. So the financial instability hypothesis, um, this idea of hedge speculative Ponzi finance, none of that is in this early article. This early article is an attempt to try to get financial instability into a sort of um, Hansen Samuelson multiplier accelerator model. So it's it is a model, you know, but it's not mature Minsky. Okay, it's it's Minsky on the way somewhere. And uh, the later on in later editions of Mania's Panics and Crashes, he sort of updates the footnote, but he doesn't actually update any of the argument. So he, I, I think that he is he he is not. Okay. Sometimes people think, oh, this is Kindleberger learning from Minsky and extending it to international economics. I think that's not really right. That Kindleberger wrote Meany's Panics and Crashes, you know, as a work of retirement. He's 65 years old. You know, he he he's he already has views on international crises and that, that come from his own thinking uh, and transmission internationally and so forth. And remember, Minsky is entirely about domestic. And it's about business cycles. It's about the financial 
forces that are causing business cycles um, and that an increasing fragility of business finance so that a little displacement, could, whereas Charlie is about international and it's about how large events like war and reparations are causing instabi- are causing structural uh, uh, displacements that then lead to booms and crashes. So he's thinking about depression. He's thinking about 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 war um, and uh, not about business cycles in the United States. Um, and so they became, though, I think they realized that they were fellow travelers in, and that they were both very critical as, uh, of both of of the post World War II sort of macro orthodoxy, ISLM and so forth, um, including ISLM BP, the International Extension by Mundell, who was who was Kindleberger's student, as a matter of fact, um, and they were both critical of this and looking for some alternative, um, and so they I think helped each other um, in in a comradely way. I don't know that Charlie really learned much from Minsky, and I don't know that Minsky learned much from Charlie, you know, but they were both, they were both moving in, 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 uh, in, in similar directions for their own interests. Um, and, uh, and they became friends and he, and Charlie organized a conference to sort of promote Minsky a little bit. Um, and the, uh, and, uh, he, and he also, I think they, they were both also at the Levy Institute that was created, um, and so I think they were, they became, they became friends, but I don't, I wouldn't say that they were collaborators or, uh, anything, anything, anything that close. Um, they were both busy <laughs> with their own agendas and, and not to be deflected, you know, by, from their own agendas. Um, but they realized, you know, a common spirit. Of, but I think that each yeah. was, uh, Michael revered. For not being part of the Orthodox, even though they may have been in entirely different places, but their similarity is that they were both outside the Orthodoxy and, and becoming influential that people appreciate. And, and you know, both Keynesian and monetarist Orthodoxy. I mean, yeah. they're both you know in their politics, you know, they're 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 sort of more sympathetic with the Keynesians, you know, than with the monetarists. Um, but mm. they were not sympathetic with the mechanical version of Keynesianism that became the dominant form um, in in the post World War II period. Yeah, yeah, I, I found yeah. it very interesting to be exposed to him and at MIT, and I think about this because I went on to graduate school at Princeton which was a very uh, game theoretic and mechanical oriented curriculum when I got there. People like Lester Chandler, William Baumol were now emeritus. And so I get there and it's very, uh, very rigorous and mathematical. There was part of me that was a little bit alienated. I was lucky that Axel Leyenhoof was at the Institute for Advanced Studies, and he encouraged me. He said, you know, you've done enough math in your undergraduate years. Stick with it. You'll, you'll learn and you'll enjoy and take some history courses and meet Albert Hirschman and Marcelo DiCecco and other people who were at the Institute. And at the same time, when I was an undergraduate, I was aware that in the same corridors when I was working with Edelman and Kinneberger was this brilliant guy named Paul Krugman that everybody really liked. And Paul's emphasis was another form of learning for me, which is the models aren't necessarily literal truth, but they illuminate so people can understand the process and the causality that you're trying to convey. And so he felt that which you might call there was an ambiguity or a muddiness about a Kindleberger or a Hirschman that uh, in not taking the models too literally, but as a parable, you could teach people more easily. And he and I, I don't know, you know, Paul then went on, became a journalist and very involved in policy and so forth. But, but it was a fascinating dynamic. And I guess I would have come as we're, uh, how do you say, thinking about the book and your recent writings, I want to come to the question of Ben Bernanke, who, along with my teacher, Phil Dibvig at Princeton and uh, his co-author, Diamond, just won a Nobel Prize. And I know you you saw how Kindleberger saw Bernanke. I had met Ben 
that he had let me read his PhD dissertation long before he was a policy official. Even I think he was at Stanford. He hadn't come to Princeton yet. But what was going on in the dynamic between Bernanke, who seemed to be reaching back to history and maybe a little more institutional texture than a pure modeler like a Krugman, but your article illuminated Kinderberger had some concerns about Bernanke's thinking. Um, well, uh, I think you're referring to this letter. It's not actually in the book that, that this, but when I was in the archives, when I was in the archives, I found this letter that uh, Charlie had written to Bernanke in 1981. Um, uh, that was, uh, and you could see that it was a uh, Bernanke was at Stanford and had sent him a draft of this article. It's the article that's published in 1983, the one that's cited in the Nobel in the Nobel uh, uh, Prize. And um, and it's it, this is you know 28 year old Bernanke sending to 70 something year old <laughs> Kindleberger. Here's something I've written that you might be interested in. I'm, I ask you for comments. And so Charlie gave him comments, you know, and he said, you know, really, I think, number one, <laughs> you know, you seem not to have read World in Depression. OK, um, I have a story about what caused that. And it's about credit. OK, but it's not the credit story that you're telling. Um, and the credit story that you're telling also is not really right. And he so he 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 walks him through various criticisms of his article. Um, and also Bernanke had sort of dismissed, well, there's Minsky and there's Kindleberger who just say that it's all about irrationality. And he says, no, that's not in fact at all what we're saying. There are dynamics of instability. And so he tried to, you know, set young Ben Bernanke on the straight and narrow and had no effect whatsoever. You know, you can see the published article has made no changes. There's no citation of world and depression. There's nothing. So the um, it, so Bern Bernanke was didn't know what to make of this. OK, and I think I think, you know, you were mentioning Krugman and about this idea of models, you know, that this is one of the this is one of the things that we can learn from Kimberger, right, that if you think that you have translated all of the useful insights of Kindleberger, okay, when you have Diamond Dibvig model of, uh, or or when you have 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 Brent Ben Bernanke's credit, you haven't. You know, he himself says you haven't. So there, you you should still go back. There's more there. There's more there. Go back. They they've they've found some model that seems to have some aspect. You know, but instead of saying, OK, now we can forget about Kindleberger, let's build on Diamond Divvig, you know, let's build on this and let's just create more and more variations of this. You know, I, I think there's there's actually pay dirt <laughs> that 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 graduate students can find, OK, in these older texts, inspiration for other kinds of modeling. Um, and you, you mentioned one of these things about finance, you know, the. The, the standard sort of um, simplification in asset pricing, right, is intertemporal general equilibrium, transversality condition. You know, the, they're they're all where you're you're imagining that you have full information out into the future, and that is a that's a a that gives you a model. Okay, it gives you something that you can close and you can solve. Okay, it's not true. You know, it's not true about the world, okay? And really, everyone knows it's not true. It's a story, okay? It's a story that maybe we we sometimes find a little excessively comforting because the thinking that the world is like that, okay, is comforting. Um, but the world is not like that. And so if you behave as if the world like is like that, it's going to hand you your hat every now and then, you know, and so and all traders know that, you know, these are really just models. You know, that's not actually how the world works. OK, and you mentioned that Charlie hadn't really, you know, he, and neither did Minsky really bring bring modern finance into their world because they were growing up. You're important to appreciate in a time when capital markets were really closed down. You know, in the Great Depression and in World War World War II, you know, the capital that flowed internationally, it, this was government finance. It was it was not it was not 
commercial finance, uh, not not a commercial logic. Okay, capital markets recovered really fine, you know, in the '60s and 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 so forth. And modern finance sort of got going in the '70s, which is which is when I said Charlie's career is already tailing down. So so he's really much more on the on the money side of the world. Okay, and at where you're thinking about payments, you're thinking about short term capital flows with, in order to keep reserves from flowing. So he comes from a money and banking more place and not about asset valuation of, of stocks and bonds and things like that. Um, I think that so that's when I said I can learn from from Charlie. But where we need to then build is you have to bring finance much more seriously into this than either Minsky or or Kindleberger did. That's the big thing that got added really when they were at the end of their careers. Um, and there, and so that's 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 that's, the, that's my ambition is to is to move things sort of in that direction, take some of that wisdom that they have. Okay. And now look at modern finance. This is why I wrote the earlier book, you know, the Fisher Black and the and the and the revolutionary idea of finance is to Really, really get deeply into one of the great minds there, so that you can see. Well, what? Okay, now we can we can think. Remember that Kindleberger and Fisher Black are at MIT at the same time. Okay. I took courses from both of them. <laughs> yeah, and so and so there's there there's a, there's some intellectual you know cross fertilization somewhere, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe just in the minds of their students, <laughs> like mm -hmm. like you. That you could see, you know, there's something each one of them seems to know about the world that seems right, okay, and yet, and yet they seem also in contradiction. So how can this be so, you know? And of course, that's how how thought advances. Like, how can this be so? How can this be so? And that's instead of saying this one's right, that one's wrong, say, well, each of us has a little piece of the truth. It's touching the elephant, you know, that we in trying to figure out how this, what this creature is, you know? And if you're just touching the tail, you have no idea. If you're just touching the tusk, you have no idea. You need to touch it in multiple places to get a picture of this elephant that is, that is the, the global economy. Well, it's funny, when I became an economics major, I had grown up in a very turbulent place called Detroit, Michigan. And in my first advanced micro course, I would listen to these conversations about equilibrium. And I raised my hand. I wasn't trying to be a smart ass, but I raised my hand and I said, you talk about equilibrium. Isn't it like, isn't it like assuming a happy ending? <laughs> and two, a, not, not that semester, but the following semester, which uh, I took my first econometrics course. We were in the middle of a section on Fourier transformation which is something as an electrical engineer, which I became my other major, I was doing a lot of Fourier transformation. And I remember saying to him, Professor Ku, I, I'm having a hard time because when you do a Fourier transformation in a laser light laboratory or whatever, it fits exactly. And when you do it with time series data and economics, the answer, it just looks like mud. It doesn't look like it. It's, and so there was something about the formalism that I was curious to learn, but I thought it applied very well to engineering or boat design or aerodynamics. I didn't find it transportable with the same kind of what you might call quality of result when it came to economics. And then meeting Kindleberger, who was coming from another direction, or meeting Fisher Black, whose course on options and so forth I took at the Sloan School, I just kind of, how would I say, I didn't feel like I needed certain answers. But I was skeptical about whether economics could teach me about what happened in growing up in Detroit, because it never felt like an equilibrium. It felt like an avalanche. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that I was born in Detroit, um, no. but we but we only lived there a couple of weeks, you know. So I don't remember well, it. Either. But the um, yeah. it's on my birth certificate still. But the um, 
So Charlie viewed, I mean, as an American institutionalist, you know, his image of the economy is much more biological, okay, it's mm. than, than engineering, mm. right? That it's about institutional evolution. It Darwinian, he would say, Darwinian evolution, where you're you're, you know, there's there's challenges, environmental challenges, and and you're responding to them. But the environment is changing too. And so you're this is this is what we need to appreciate. So when you're you're looking at a time series, <laughs> you're looking at data that's been collected over a long period of time, when in fact, the beginning data generating process is not the same as the data generating process at the end. Yes, there's a GDP, you know, in each place. But the but assuming that these data are being generated by the same process, and therefore, you can use a transformation, you know, that's what you're assuming when you're doing these Fourier transformations, right? That there's an underlying constancy, um, which he would deny. That's just, and of course he denied that because he grew up in, in the depression and World War II. You know, it is these moments of discontinuity are, are, are formative in his idea about, about how the world works. And not in the transformations in the World War II, after World War II as well. I mean, remember that, that the European currencies were not convertible until 1958, you know, and that the uh, and then, you know, Nixon um, takes the U.S. off gold in 71. This is a big, a big transformation. Um, and then the, the Volcker shock of 79, you know, it just seems unlikely that the that the resulting data series is the result of a stationary uh, process. Um, and so you can. You can, you know, you can throw this math at it, you know, but but what knowledge are you going to get out of that? You know, what is this really the right method? It depends on what questions you have, of course. Um, but for him, I think he, you know, he sometimes would pretend that he 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 never retooled when when economics moved in this econo in this mathematical direction. He never retooled. I think he never retooled because he never saw the reason for it. You know that he had in twelve years of government service played a very important role in reach, in shaping the post-World War II institutional structure and without the help of advanced mathematics and econometrics. And so did everyone else in the New Deal. You know, so so he knew that the old ways could could work. They they could really, you know, they could help you. Um, and so he was never, uh, you know, that impressed. Um, and in fact, late in life, um, I quote some of this in the book too. Um, he, he, of course, couldn't say that so much when he was on the MIT faculty, because, but but later on when he was not on the MIT faculty, he would say things. I, I use this as an epigram in one of the chapters. You know, the day of positive economics, okay, is not yet. You know, we don't have enough knowledge of how the world works to know that if you change this dial, this thing will happen. You know, we we don't know that. We don't know that. We know very little about there. There are some things maybe that we can build on, you know, but they're very primitive and they're very fundamental and that you can that you can rely on. You know, that's how he was thinking in the in the in the in his third career post retirement. And he was quite he was quite evangelical about that. You know, so he uh, and uh, maybe he you know, he 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 encouraged you because you were good at math and he felt that. You know, this was and you could do history, too. Right. And so this was not somehow distracting you from learning about the world. And maybe some of it would wind up being useful. Um, and uh, so he was not uh, he didn't view this necessarily as the enemy. In that sense, he's not he's not actively heterodox or something like that in the in the way that sort of Minsky kind of became um, he. And why isn't he? Well, because he's a central banker. You know, he knows how central bankers think. He knows how. You know, the economists at the State Department think like that's not heterodox. You know, that's just useful. That's just useful. So he he never felt himself to be, um, you know, he was an outsider. He was on the fringe of academia. OK, but he never felt himself to be somehow uh, not part of world history. I think he did feel that he had ancestors and that and that and that he would have he would have a, a legacy also. Um, uh, that would follow after him, despite the fact that he was on the fringe during a certain historical episode. Um, and he had that long, that long view. And I think he was right about that, you know, and I, 
you know, I, I told you, you started this by asking, how did I come to this? You know, that I wasn't originally going to do Kindleberger. I was going to do the global dollar. Um, and when I found Kindleberger, I found somebody who, who really helped me do the global dollar. And, uh, and I, and I think he will, he will help, you know, the young, the, the people who read the book too, that, that to understand what are the dynamics that are driving this, you know, what, that the key currency approach is kind of correct <laughs> and has been proven by history. And so the, 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 the insistence on sticking with Mundell Fleming or, or, or jazzing it up by now let's add another tweak or here, you know, that's how academia works, but it's uh, you should look outside the window a little bit and see, and see, uh, see, so get some historical perspective and, and appreciate like, there are other ways of thinking about about the world um, that might yes. that might give you more that might might get to the core of what's happening um, yeah. better. Yeah. Well, I know uh, years later, I saw a report that David Collender and Bob Solo wrote, and they had surveyed economics graduate students about what did what did you need to know, and basically. 90 or 85 to 95 percent said you need to know statistics and math and be good at those things. Only 13 percent said you need to know anything about the institutions of the economy. Mm. But, you know, as, as I, I, I was along, one of those students, I was at Harvard then and I took that survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I found that fascinating. And then as yeah. I moved along, uh, when I was in graduate school at Princeton, I went down to Rutgers and Paul Davidson was talking about the lack of ergodic stability, and he was writing a, a book about Keynes. And uh, and then later on, through the economist Peter Kennan, I met Paul Volcker, who liked to go fishing. He had a nautical propensity as well, but he he really was not at all convinced by what you might call the efficient markets or stable ergodically stable dynamic programming or any of that kind of stuff. He was, I felt like having known Charlie a little bit helped me feel comfortable in getting to know Paul Volcker. And as you, I'm sure. Well, well sure. Remember, he's a central banker. He's, he has, yeah. he has a, yeah. he's a central banking yeah. kind of view of the world that central bankers know, as Badgett said a long time ago, you know, that, that money doesn't manage itself. And Lombard Street yeah, has a lot a, of money to manage that, that it is a, it's yeah. a system that, you know, tends to crisis. And so it needs to be yes. watched. And yes. uh, that's something that's not really in the economic models, you know, but it's in the world and central bankers cannot avoid it. That's in fact, the center that's of their right. attention. Um, and, and Charlie had a big lesson in that, you know, at the New York Fed um, and, and at the BIS, so, which he never forgot. So he's a central banking um, sensibility, I would say. Um, and, that's, and, and naturally that would connect with, with Paul Volcker. Uh, as well. Yeah, well, we, as you know, from the yeah. outset at INET, we did a lot of work with the Volcker Alliance and uh, found him very nourishing. But let, let me, we, I think we draw things to a close here. If the spirit of Charlie Kindleberger were to join us on this cast, what would he say about crypto and what's happening in the crypto world these days? <laughs> well, I think, I think he would he would add a chapter to Mania's Panics and Crashes and put out an eighth edition. And, and in fact, that's what is happening, that Robert McCauley, okay, who was a student of his, um, is, now the, is, is now putting out the eighth edition of Mania's and Panics and Crashes. And I, I understand that he's added a chapter on crypto uh, as well. So that it, it would be one of those, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. We're seeing, we're seeing it's, it's different technology, you know, it's different uh, you know, all of this, the, 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 the formal structure, but it's not something we haven't seen before. Okay. And the, uh, and he would analogize to previous, uh, to previous crises. So, um, the, so the displacement that God crypto started, I imagine he would talk about the global financial crisis and the response to that, you know, which was zero interest rates in the global north, you know, and uh, the so that, you know, crypto grew in that kind of unusual experience, you know, but that's not going to go on forever. And now now we're in the discipline phase 
and uh, and we're finding out, you know, what was what was real and what wasn't, and and most of it most of it was not. Um, the uh, you know, Bitcoin was supposed to be a kind of digital gold. Um, I remember when students were with this. So this is before FTX and modern stuff. You know that it's an asset that's nobody's liability, and they were an, often analogizing to the gold standard. And 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 of course, Charlie knew how the gold standard worked, and he would say, "It's not really right to say that gold was money. Sterling was money." OK, and and what is sterling? Sterling is a promise to pay gold. OK, it's credit. It's a form of credit. And under the dollar standard, it's the same. You know, under Bretton Woods, the dollar was a promise to pay gold. When you took gold out of the picture, it's still a promise to pay. So it's a credit system, really. You know, and so Bitcoin is not the notion that you're 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 using wrong monetary theory. If you think that Bitcoin is going to challenge the dollar, <laughs> that's not that's not going to be right. That's not going to work. Um, and, uh, and I told my students that when, when, when the, when Bitcoin, and so I started, I didn't pay attention to it because of that. Um, the, uh, cause I, cause this claim that it was going to replace the dollar seemed to me so obviously, obviously false, but it did other things, you know, it, it, so they, they created this little parallel bubble universe. And then the stable coins came along, which created a bridge between you know, fiat world and crypto world, which really blew things up, um, which is now collapsing um, that we're seeing. So so you'll see this chapter by Bob McCauley um, in Mania's Panics and Crashes. I, I think he is trying to channel Charlie in thinking about in thinking about this uh, uh, this issue. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for thank you for all you do for INET. I'm sure they will enjoy hearing your thoughts today uh, at the, in the Young Scholars Initiative and, uh, and beyond. But, uh, but I, Perry, you've been an enormous contributor to INET, and you've been an enormously interesting writer about finance throughout your career. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to know you, and I very much admire the work that you do. But, well, thank you, and 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 thank you for INET's support. <laughs> it's made a big difference these last ten years. It really has. Well, you've made a big difference. So, we got value for money. This isn't crypto. This isn't <laughs> crypto scholarship. This is the real thing. <laughs> At any rate, let's adjourn for today. I look forward to the next chapter with you uh, down the road. Maybe we'll bring on Bob McCauley and do a three-way discussion of the sure. Uh, that would be great. Augmented be great. Uh, media's panics and crashes. That'd be fun.